everyone welcome back to the complex trauma recovery podcast um this is my first episode after taking a break for a month because i was finishing school so thank you for being patient with me and yeah this is the first episode that i've gotten to make as a no longer grad student so that is super exciting um i won't have my diploma for a few months but still feels good to know I'm done. This episode is going to be about kind of CPTSD 101, like just introduction and just kind of the fundamentals. And I I know maybe this should have been my first episode, but I've had a lot of people ask me for resources that they can send their loved ones. Like if I'm trying to get my partner or my friend or like someone supportive in my life to understand CPTSD, is there something that uh, that I can send them? And so maybe this episode can kind of be helpful for that if you're trying to um, like share education about CPTSD or maybe it'll help clear things up um, for people who are kind of still new to learning about it. The first thing I want to discuss is, is CPTSD a real diagnosis or not? Because as we know, it is not in the DSM-5. This has led some people to, I think, a misconception that CPTSD hasn't really been studied or verified and that's really not true. There's actually um, research on the syndrome of complex trauma and CPTSD going back for decades and it was also entered um, as a ICD code so the World Health Organization proposed it as a separate diagnosis which is available for billing for coding like when you bill for services there's a there's a code for it now in the ICD-11 I believe but it's still not in the DSM. A lot of the research around complex trauma may also be called different things because CPTSD and complex trauma is kind of a wide umbrella, right? Um, the criteria for CPTSD and for complex trauma has to do with repeated exposures to ongoing trauma in a prolonged recurring way. And so this can like mean so many different things. Um, so there's a lot of research on, for example, ongoing developmental childhood trauma. And that's a, a specific kind of CPTSD um, that occurs in childhood. There's been lots of research on the kind of uh, CPTSD and trauma symptomology among people who survive domestic violence. Um, and that is a kind of CPTSD. So this research is, is out here. Um, it was proposed actually originally as a separate syndrome by a woman, the last name is Herman. I don't remember the first name right now but she worked with domestic violence survivors and she explained the syndrome from repeated ongoing exposure to trauma. Koch, the author of The Body Keeps the Score, also did some really early work on the idea of complex developmental trauma among children. So there's a lot of research around this topic, but it has not been like codified in the DSM yet. What differentiates CPTSD from PTSD? And I'm referring to the criteria that was put forth in the ICD and by the World Health Organization. This is kind of the proposed criteria, the diagnostic criteria that we maybe would see in the DSM at some point. So CPTSD contains elements from the standard PTSD diagnosis. Those elements are hypervigilance, sense of the threat being real, like in the moment, flashbacks, re-experiencing the past in the present, and avoidance, avoidance of triggers and avoidance of things that might trigger a flashback. Those are the criteria that are in PTSD that are also in CPTSD. Now there's additional criteria. The additional criteria for CPTSD is dysregulation in three biopsychosocial arenas. The first is emotional dysregulation. So chronic difficulties regulating emotions and chronic emotional dysregulation. The second is dysregulated self-concept and self-organization. Uh, an unstable or low sense of self-worth and a fragmented or incoherent sense of identity and self um, is, is the additional criteria. The third additional criteria is dysregulation in attachments and ability to form relationships. So I've talked about that a lot. Insecure attachment styles are um, one of the differential symptoms for CPTSD. That's a, that's a loose outline, but a lot can fit under that. CPTSD doesn't show up for any two people exactly the same. That's the general framework that's been laid out. Like there are changes in the ability to regulate emotions, the ability to form relationships, and 
sense of self-concept, self-identity, and self-worth, um, in addition to the hypervigilance and, and those PTSD symptoms that I mentioned. So that's that's kind of the the brief explanation of what CPTSD is. Under this like CPTSD umbrella, there are so many different kinds of complex trauma. So intergenerational historical trauma, like racial trauma, are examples of complex trauma. You know, that kind of complex trauma can be added onto a list of other kinds of complex trauma, such as developmental trauma, um, which is trauma from like early in your vulnerable developmental years, uh, maybe like not having your attachment and security needs met, not having caregivers that were attuned to you, um, these different things that create like insecure attachment styles. And you can also develop CPTSD as an adult um, from any sort of ongoing and repeated trauma. So like CPTSD is really common for people who have been incarcerated, who have been in, in abusive relationships, who have been prisoners of war, um, survivors from abusive residential schools and boarding schools, like these scenarios where you experience something over and over and over again and you feel helpless to change your circumstances as you might in childhood or an array of other circumstances, um, like kind of lays the foundation for CPTSD. So it can show up in a lot of different ways. Um, I do hope it will be in the DSM at some point <laughs> because I think that would be helpful for a lot of people. One of the areas of contention that uh, the, a debate that's been going on in psychology that has I don't know, possibly hindered it being added to the DSM has to do with how similar the symptoms of CPTSD are to what is currently called borderline personality disorder. And so there's a whole debate about that. But that is a topic for another episode. That's like a whole a whole hole whole, whole to go down. So you have a chronic dysregulation in like these three main areas, your your emotions, your relationships and your self concept, your your way of viewing yourself. And um, this this impacts like every area of our lives, you know, our self-esteem, our relationships, our coping tools, um, like everything. And so, um, yeah, it's still it's still like an emerging field of research for sure that I hope will continue to be expanded upon. But there's a lot of research to to draw on already. And we know that even in uh, Herman's really early work with domestic violence survivors, she talked about a process uh, being needed to recover from those experiences that included grieving, um, grieving for the loss and the pain and the experiences, and reconnecting to a sense of autonomy, a, tens- a sense of self, a sense of empowerment, reconnecting to the body, reconnecting to the emotions. And that idea of grieving and reconnecting is found in a lot of the literature on CPTSD. Even uh, newer books like Pete Walker's book, Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving, um, this idea of needing to grieve and reconnect with emotions that have been numbed out or dissociated from as part of the healing process has been in the literature for a long time, um, as has this idea of reconnecting. And Gaber Mate says something that I really like about trauma, which is that Trauma isn't just the story of what happens. Um, it's the resulting disconnection from yourself and from the world and from other people that continues to pop up in the present moment and create this like endless sense of loneliness and disconnection and alienation and fear and all this different stuff for people with CPTSD. The issue with, um, I think, CPTSD not being well understood and not uh in the forefront of mental health clinicians awareness and practitioners awareness is that there's a lot of protocols for acute PTSD that need to be altered to be appropriate for CPTSD so if you watch my interview with Melissa uh with Melissa Parks about EMDR she talked about how you know there's kind of a standard EMDR protocol but that this is a protocol that works better for someone who has a few solitary traumas Um, where you can point to it and you can be like, yeah, that's what happened this day, this memory, and then you reprocess those memories. And that's with acute standard PTSD, where maybe there's standalone events or a few isolated events that created the PTSD. Um, But with CPTSD, you have disturbances that go deeper and create um, more, uh, more complexity in the 
experience of the trauma and the necessary treatment protocols. So I've talked to a lot of people with CPTSD who were like, yeah, I tried to go do EMDR and, you know, I couldn't do like a trauma timeline or I couldn't even really remember clear memories because amnesia and memory loss is a really common thing with recurring ongoing childhood trauma. And so there are there are therapeutic protocols that um, that need to be adapted based on an understanding of how CPTSD is different than PTSD and um, how having an insecure attachment pattern, a negative sense of self-worth, at difficulty trusting others, and a chronic dismo- emotional dysregulation, you know, makes a lot of kinds of therapy either challenging or inaccessible or even potentially triggering or dangerous. I've talked a little bit about that before on here. So um, the, the way that you approach CPTSD is really different than acute PTSD, and that's why it's really important to differentiate between um, these different kinds of trauma and um, and I mean we need more uh, evidence-based research to um, create the proper protocols for treating complex trauma but there are quite a few that are out there already and that I'm a really big fan of so because CPTSD affects people so much on all levels of the self and results in this chronic dysregulation in these different ways, it can show up as a lot of different disorders. So a really common thing is for people with CPTSD to have a list of like 10 or 15 diagnoses that they received, five or 10 or 15 different diagnoses they received before they learned about CPTSD. Um, You know, the chronic emotional dysregulation and chronic nervous system dysregulation can show up as chronic anxiety, chronic depression, It can be misdiagnosed as mood disorders, personality disorders. Um, It can be self-medicated with addictions and eating disorders, which then become other diagnoses. It can show up as obsessive compulsive disorder. It can it can show up in a lot of different ways. Um, So a lot of times people with CPTSD, especially those who have been trying to seek help through therapy for a long time and not really getting relief. They may feel very pathologized. They may feel very ashamed. They may feel like, um, you know, broken or like there's something wrong with them or like none of the treatment is going to work. So this is a really common experience for people with CPTSD um, because it's not being identified properly. It's not being treated properly. A lot of these clients end up being labeled as like treatment resistant or um, or just really internalize a sense of hopelessness from not getting the mental health care that they need. So another difference that um, can be really helpful to understand is the difference in how flashbacks can be experienced with CPTSD versus PTSD. So with PTSD, when they talk about re-experiencing a traumatic memory in a flashback, there's often a strong visual and memory component where you're flashing back to a specific event, reliving it, re-experiencing it. With CPTSD, there, there may not be a specific event that you flash back to. Um, Pete Walker talks about what he calls emotional flashbacks, which are common with CPTSD. They're also called amygdala hijackings. And um, this is when you have a flashback and you may not be thinking about a specific memory or having a specific image in your mind, but you are overwhelmed with the emotions from a time in your life when you were helpless and traumatized. So... This can feel like um, very debilitating and sudden, overwhelming panic and shame and, um, you know, urges to self-protect or um, use familiar coping mechanisms and uh, just a very childlike sense of like pain, pain and panic and um, hopelessness and helplessness. And so this is something that a lot of people have been experiencing and they never knew the terminology for it because they were like, oh, well, I couldn't really relate to the idea of visual flashbacks because I don't have specific memories I flash back to, but I just get hit with this horrible feeling sometimes. And so um, learning how to recognize emotional flashbacks is uh, a really important piece to differentiating between PTSD and CPTSD. Another thing that I that I think is helpful to keep in mind is that PTSD and CPTSD has been conceptualized as a psychological injury, um, as a brain injury. Specifically, uh, this is really common with like developmental trauma, because when your brain is in its most vulnerable developmental 
stages, recurring ongoing trauma has really significant impacts on brain development, um, but it can also occur in adulthood. And so um, recurring ongoing exposure to trauma alters the way that your brain and nervous system develops. Um, and I differentiate it from a mental illness, right? It's not a mental illness. It's a, it's a psychological injury. It is a physiological as well as emotional and mental result of these experiences that compromise the sense of safety, which is needed to um, develop these different like skills and um, connections with yourself, with, with others. Um, even things like the ability to, to emotionally regulate begins with co-regulation, which is found in secure attachments. So the, the struggles that people with CPTSD have have a very biological physiological basis um i've talked about this more in other episodes about like polyvagal theory i think i'm going to do another episode soon about somatic healing but this idea that the trauma is stored in the body is not just metaphorical it's very literal um the the trauma quite literally alters the way that your brain interprets information um and that your nervous system reacts to your experiences. So a lot of people with CPTSD may not know that they have CPTSD. And this is also kind of different from PTSD because if you, for example, felt pretty safe, felt pretty, you know, secure most of your life, and then you had one really disruptive, terrifying experience that all of a sudden took away your sense of safety in the world, it would be really noticeable that that had happened, right? Um, that your whole world had changed. But if you experience ongoing recurring trauma, especially in your childhood, in your family of origin, it feels normal. Um, whatever is happening in kids' families feels normal. And a lot of people with CPTSD may not even recognize that they have it because they've never known anything else. Um, they have never known anything else in terms of their environment, their relationships. Or they've never known anything else in terms of their internal experience. Like they have felt unsafe and had CPTSD symptoms for so long and just been diagnosed with so many different things that um, they're not even really aware. And there's a lot of people that will say like, well, I don't have any trauma. And then when you talk a little bit more, um, you can see that there is a story of trauma. There's a story of attachment trauma, of loss of safety, loss of connections and relationships and security. But this was not perceived as trauma or processed as trauma, partially due to societally, you know, narrowing and limiting definitions of what trauma is. So this is why someone could not know they have it for a very long time, combined with a lot of therapists not even knowing about it um, and the normalization of whatever your experiences have been. Another important point to make is that not everyone who is exposed to trauma experiences CPTSD or PTSD. So trauma exposure does not guarantee a trauma disorder. Um, there are a number of what we call protective factors and risk factors, risk and resiliency factors. So for example, if a child experienced something traumatic, but um, they have a really strong relationship with their parent, with their caregiver who believes them and helps them process and heal from that, that child is less likely to end up with PTSD or CPTSD, even if they did experience a traumatic event, because they had the protective factors of a strong parental relationship and access to resources, um, you know, being allowed to feel and label their emotions, like these sorts of things. Um, being, you know, part of a community, feeling connected to other people, feeling connected to a sense of purpose. There's a lot of different protective factors that can be uh, buffering, bu create a buffering effect for traumatic experiences. Because I do believe that trauma is a part of the world and is a part of life, um, especially when you think about like collective trauma, intergenerational trauma. But not everyone who's been exposed to trauma has a trauma disorder. So trauma disorders like CPTSD and PTSD specifically happen when the event is disrupting enough or chronic and frequent and ongoing enough um, that it develops into CPTSD or PTSD. And 
CPTSD and PTSD are both really defined by this experience of the past threat still being present. Like, whatever it was, emotionally, physically, um, whatever that experience was, it still feels like a present threat. And um, this is not guaranteed from having a traumatic experience. So there's a lot of complicated factors that go into someone developing CPTSD. And that's just another common misconception that I wanted to throw into this 101 video. Another question I get a lot is what kinds of therapy are best for CPTSD? And um, although I have my opinions and my thoughts about this, I think what really matters more than anything else is you having a therapist that you are comfortable with, that you feel safe with, and who understands complex trauma, who can adapt protocols to meet your needs, right? Um, who will not accidentally re-traumatize you or, um, you know, provide unhelpful or triggering or, um, you know, just inaccessible therapy um, because they don't have a good understanding of complex trauma. So you want a therapist who understands what complex trauma is, what attachment trauma is, and has ways of working with it and can build a relationship with you and, and plan out the best treatment for you. You know, it varies for everybody. Um, some, some people really benefit from combining, from doing like DBT or um, dialectical behavioral therapy or um, trauma-focused CBT or these different things to learn like emotional regulation techniques. And then um, once they've kind of stabilized, they'll do like EMDR for reprocessing or um, a more bottom-up modality like somatic experiencing. Um, other people, the cognitive approaches really don't work for. I'm one of them really like just kind of kept me stuck in my head. So I'm a really big fan of any sort of therapy that takes into consideration the role of the nervous system and the biological and physiological aspects of trauma and doesn't just try to get people to think their way out of trauma responses because that usually does not really work. Um, so some examples of that are EMDR, but again, like I said earlier, it has to be EMDR that is adapted for complex trauma and not just a standard protocol. So it's all about your trust in the therapist, your relationship with them, and their understanding of, of your history and of, of CPTSD. Um, internal family systems can be a really great one, especially for people who experience structural dissociation and um, structural dissociation would also be a good topic for a whole episode, but that is when the personality and sense of self becomes somewhat fragmented into different, maybe even contradicting parts, and you may be dissociated from certain parts of yourself um, or have different parts of yourself that seem to be at odds with each other, like a desire for closeness, but a self-protective part that pushes people away. So internal family systems can be really great for that. Um, there are a number of different like somatic therapeutic approaches. So dance therapy, somatic therapy, somatic experiencing, um, polyvagal informed, nervous system informed therapy. These are all going to be, I mean, there's such a wide range of how you can do this. But if a therapist understands the way that trauma is stored in the body and can be processed through the body, they can help you find, you know, a somatic piece to your therapeutic uh, treatment planning. That can be really, really helpful. Um, and then there's like a whole category of therapy that's kind of known under the umbrella as like relational therapy or attachment focused therapy. And this is based on ideas of um, the relationship with the therapist is the therapy, like the security and safety of the relationship is it's not just about that therapist's ability to deliver these different advanced techniques. It's actually about their ability to help give you experiences of safety and safe connection with another human being that you, that you were missing um, and co-regulation, emotional co-regulation. So there's a number of different um, therapeutic modalities that kind of target these issues of like attachment and relational impairment. Um, and that can be done in, in a number of ways. So I definitely recommend that um i think ultimately different things work for different people but keeping in mind that the relationship is the most important part and that a therapist who understands complex trauma and attachment 
should hopefully be able to adapt protocols and treatment plan in a way that will be effective for you. And, you know, it, it's not a one size fits all, um, not a one size fits all prescription. Definitely different paths depending on your, you know, your trauma symptoms, your priorities, um, your needs, your experiences, your identity. For people with CPTSD who didn't know that they had it and who are still connecting the dots, um, Pete Walker talks a lot about the importance of deminimizing and grieving, um, reconnecting with the emotions that you became disconnected from, like anger or sadness. Um, and so this process of grieving and then um, finding or refinding a sense of safety and security in the world and in your body, which is a very complex process. And um, also building self-compassion. Like I think compassion focus and emotion focus therapies are really helpful because people with CPTSD, we tend to be really hard on ourselves and we tend to um, be disconnected from emotions or completely overwhelmed by emotions and not really know how to uh, accept them, have compassion for them, process them, and, and regulate them. So um, I hope this has been helpful, just kind of like an overview of what CPTSD is, how it's different from PTSD, what kind of things are helpful in treating it. And um, if you are someone that is listening to this because you love someone who has CPTSD and they sent this to you and you're wondering what you can do to support them, um, whether it's, you know, a friendship, a romantic relationship, a family relationship, um, being someone who can hold space for these conversations, who can create the safety of, like, we're allowed to talk about this. This can be a dialogue. Um, we can talk about triggers. We can talk about fears of abandonment. We can talk about flashbacks. Like, these are things that a lot of people with CPTSD have just been living with internalized and in shame for a long time and so creating relational safety where um you know where you can be someone that uh provides acceptance and compassion for these really like difficult things that's that's uh really substantial right there um another thing is getting to understand uh the person that you care about what their triggers are, what their experiences are, what helps them regulate, and being able to co-regulate with them. So co-regulation can literally look like anything from like cuddling and hugging um, to talking and crying together to like laughing and watching a movie together, um, you know, going on a walk and being like in rhythm with each other while you talk. Like it is the process of two mammals' nervous systems becoming attuned to each other uh, to create a mutual sense of, of relaxation and safety. And so a lot of people with CPTSD have been missing that. And um, that's a conversation you can have. Like, what, what helps you regulate? What helps you co-regulate? Um, how can I, you know, support you in that? And, yeah, just, like, lots of learning. I mean, um, I have a Google document with a bunch of links to read more about all of this different kind of stuff. Um, you can always attend a counseling session with someone to support them or um, learn more about what they're doing. Like there's there's so many ways to like get involved and be a supportive person. But um, relationships are a really significant vehicle for healing um, for people with CPTSD because uh, I would say you know, a uh, a really common form of CPTSD is very much relational. Like it happens in the context of our close relationships. And so this idea of reparative experiences and what's hurt in relationships is healed in relationships um, is basically that the more safe experiences someone has of being close to someone, like, oh, it can be safe to be close um, or to be vulnerable or to be intimate. Um, the more these reparative experiences can help shift someone's um, sense of safety and um, it can support them learning a secure attachment style. And um, yeah, the, the significance of healthy and supportive relationships in CPTSD recovery really cannot be understated. So um, if you are listening because you're trying to be that supportive person for someone, thank you. And 
I hope that this was helpful. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. Okay, thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, I am going to be trying to make more regular content again, but I am also about to move. So it's going to be kind of a crazy summer, but um, I will be trying to release episodes more regularly again. Um, I have a guest episode in a couple weeks that I'm super excited about. Please, if you're listening on YouTube, please like and subscribe, or um, you can also subscribe or leave a review on um, Apple Podcast or uh, Spotify, like any of the podcast platforms. That really helps me out. And I also have a Patreon. Um, the cheapest subscription is $5 a month, and it, it really helps support the work I'm doing when people subscribe to that. You also get extra podcast episodes on there. So thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you next episode. Thank you.